Up next, we have Valerie from Benefit Cosmetics. So while she sets up, I'll um, tell you about our next speaker. With more than 15 years leading account management and strategic services, Valerie is, as she puts it, finally getting a taste of her own medicine, which thankfully comes with a spoonful of sugar at Benefit Cosmetics, where the tagline is something that everybody has to hear. Laughter is the best cos cosmetic, so grin and wear it. <laughs> Valerie is VP of Digital Experience and Commerce at Benefit Cosmetics and focuses on a topic that we have been very excited by today all the way from George Edward's presentation, e-commerce. Valerie is responsible for the growth of the brand's global e-commerce channel, sales, digital media, and online marketing, all buzzwords that we've been talking about quite a bit today. With a rich history of experience with a plethora of interactive agencies and personal care brands, including Method, please join me in welcoming Valerie. about Benefit in case you're not familiar, I won't bore you with a big long spiel. Um, we are a San Francisco based beauty prestige brand. Um, we were founded in 1976, so we're still a baby compared to some of the giants that are in this room right now. Um, acquired by LVMH in 1999, which really allowed us to fuel a lot of growth, in particular international growth. We are now sold in more than 3,000 counters and more than 30 countries worldwide. Um, for a relatively young brand, we have a very nice international mix. We're about one-third American sales, one-third European, and one-third Asian. Um, LVMH really helped us enter the Asian markets with speed. Um, our products and services are sold through brow bars, um, so that's unusual for a beauty brand. We offer services as well as sell products, and uh, we're actually the number one provider of uh, brow arch services around the world something that we ourselves barely know, much, much, much less something that our market has learned, but that does create a very nice repeat uh, relationship for us with our customers who come in regularly for those services as much as you might go get a haircut regularly. Um, we are also sold through a lot of specialty retailers like Sephora in the United States and Europe, um, Douglas in Germany, and then department stores, which is a significant percentage of our business. Um, because we've been focused on international growth as a big part uh, of our organization. I think we have relatively empowered local markets. Um, it's just part of growing very quickly. We're a very entrepreneurial organization, and so we have strong people in those markets, and that's a big part of why we've been able to leverage social media very effectively. Um, one of the areas where we're quite young as an organization, I mean, the whole organization is young, but digital is young as well. Um, I actually created the digital team in 2010, so we've been running to catch up with some of our competitors. Um, because it's a relatively new discipline for us as an organization, and in fact, that is one of the challenges, is creating um, a digital culture within a non-digital organization and helping to make our organization more digital. Um, how we see the digital landscape, and this is just a very high-level slide, but I like to tell people it's certainly not, sim it's not, certainly not easy, but it is simple, and people can get, find digital very, very complex. So um, this diagram really just charts in the lower left-hand corner um, components of our programs where we have a high degree of control for how we express the brand, but a relatively small reach. And in the upper right-hand corner, those areas where we have a low degree of control, but potentially an enormous reach. And we really try to focus across the spectrum. So in the lower left-hand corner, we have our own media, things like our own website, our own mobile site, which we're building out right now, our email programs. Um, owned media, and in the upper right-hand corner, earned media, the social dialogue, so consumers specifically talking about and advocating on behalf of benefit cosmetics, uh, video sharing sites like YouTube where the, the volume of video reviews and haul, re um, haul videos, so consumers talking about the products they love, um, is just tremendous. Um, blogs is another area where there's just a huge amount of activity and conversation around brands, and these are not an area that a brand can control, but nonetheless, the volume of conversation is much larger. So I like to say that we have been focused on building a room of our own in the lower left-hand corner, but going where the party's at in the right, upper right-hand corner. Because these are the places where consumers are increasingly spending their time. We absolutely see that 
social media sites are stealing time away from other media properties. So even though we would love to drive a consumer to our own website, because they're gonna have a very rich experience of our brand, we recognize that it's expensive to drive those consumers there. So a lot of our strategy is to syndicate content out in small kind of, I call them snack size bites, to that upper right hand quadrant, right? Things that our fans can share and that consumers can talk about our brand um, in a place where the reach is much, much larger. Why I believe social media should be managed locally. Um, ultimately, I think fans want to interact with other people like them and in their own language, and it's very difficult for any global brand to have that kind of competency in one home office. So we see that by having local communities that are managed by local advocates in those markets, um, we have much more greater commonality amongst the fans, which means more dialogue amongst them, fan-to-fan -fan dialogue. Um, we can be much more relevant because our product release dates tend to vary. As some of you know, doing business internationally, there's a long lead time to get new products into China. So, you know, speaking with one voice to everyone at the same time just isn't realistic in terms of how we talk about products. Um, there is a real opportunity to leverage individuals in our markets because we do have um, relatively strong teams in our markets. Um, also, topics tend to be very local. I mean. Uh, just as an example, one of our most popular posts ever was um, unfortunately on the day that Liz Taylor died and we posted one of her quotes, which was, um, a big girl deserves big diamonds, rest in peace, uh, Liz Taylor. Well, that was our most shared post of all times, right? But that is not gonna be relevant and um, hot, it's not gonna be as well known in some markets and in others and you're gonna get a poorer response rate. So social media is so inherently topical, so changing on a day-to-day -day basis that um, it's important to have people who are right in the middle of the hot topics in a given market at a given time in order to create better engagement with your consumers. Um, laughter is a key component of our DNA. As you heard earlier, our philosophy is laughter is the best cosmetics. Uh, so grin and wear it. Ultimately, we think a woman is at her most alluring and her most beautiful when she's smiling and laughing. And so we try to deliver products that have a strong functional benefit as well as products that have an emotional benefit, right? A moment of joy, sensuality, laughter, and pleasure. And um, because this is a key part of our DNA, um, we have to recognize that humor is also very local. Um, you know, what's hot and funny in one market is not always going to be hot and funny in another market. Um, finally, I think, and perhaps this is one of the most important things, customer service is really best dealt with at a local level. And much as a lot of marketers like to think of social media as a place where we push out communications to our customers, the reality is there's a huge amount of dialogue and conversation going on. And increasingly young consumers will bring their customer service issues to the brand via social media first. So our customer service manager actually monitors all of our social media channels. She's always um, following up various comments on Twitter to see if we have any negative comments about the brand, a customer who didn't have a good experience in a store. For that matter, a customer who had an amazing experience for a store. We write a personal note um, to the store manager and to the person who was praised anytime a customer uh, got, a, uh, anytime a customer advocated on behalf of our services. And our general manager signs that note and we print out the comment from social media and send it to the people in our stores as a way to reinforce positive um, activities and behavior. And that's something that really, having social media be driven locally within our markets allows us to create a much tighter feedback mechanism and loop with the people who are actually representing us in our stores. Um, we also have this long tradition of local innovation, right? And uh, it's a key competitive differentiator. I think if you're a challenger brand, you can't do things the way all of your competitors are doing uh, them. And so social media, and particularly locally strong social media, is one of the areas where we try to fight outside of our weight class a little bit. Why is that, so, by, by the way, why is it so hard to think that social media should be managed locally? Because you'd be astonished at how many brands are uncomfortable doing this. I think I'll just step away from this slide for a minute and talk about our context as marketers, right? Most of us in this room, um, you know, began marketing in an era where there were television channels and print media, and frankly, they were a very mass market. Um, I think back to when I started watching TV and there were three channels, you know, and then, ooh, we got a fourth channel, you know, and then we got cable and all of a sudden, oh, proliferation, you know, a hundred channels and now with direct TV, a thousand channels and then with YouTube, millions of channels. So we're in this process of shift from sort of very mass media to extremely niche and extremely localized media. 
all of a sudden consumers are really perhaps picking one favorite video blogger whose reviews they love and choosing to follow her, right? And so we as marketers came of age in an era where we were creating media and marketing messages for mass consumption and are suddenly thrown in the middle of social media, which is one of the most niche, relevant, personalized types of communications out there. So I just grabbed a few things and I had to like gray out a million. It was like, why did I choose to do this? I had to gray out all these names <laughs> from my friends. But you know, just go and look at your Facebook news feed sometime and look at the things that people are posting. People are posting about a place they went in their neighborhood. One of my friends was posting about the, the fires in Colorado. Another friend was post posting about a meal he had locally. Somebody else was posting something highly topical, right? Something that happened in the news at that time. This is the context in which we as marketers are trying to engage with our consumers today. It's a very, very different context and throwing a mass ad, which we, of course we publicize our ads in social media, of course we try to use assets that we've created, but we must have a different method in order to deliver more locally relevant, more topical content to our consumers in this media if we're going to get any attention in the middle of this highly personalized news feed. Um, we also have, I just added a statistic, I don't know if you, some of you who are in the digital world probably follow an organization called L2. Um, they're a think tank that looks at uh, digital competency of luxury brands and they actually studied this issue and they found that brands with localized content boast overwhelmingly higher interaction rates. And that's true in the beauty category as well as many other luxury segments. So, you know, we know that we need to be more locally specific. We know that we need to empower our local digital advocates. How exactly is this being done at Benefit? Um, we actually have chosen to have completely localized country Facebook fan pages, for example. So we have, it was 24 at the time I made this deck, now it's 26. 26 country fan pages, which we manage in 15 languages. And these pages are actually managed by our digital advocates. So we found individuals in each market, in some cases in a small market, it might be the PR or marketing manager. In a larger market, we might actually have a social media manager or an actual hire focused on digital. Um, in either case, we work on educating those individuals and they manage the communities locally based on some directive and some guidelines that they receive from the San Francisco office, which is our headquarters. Um, so the team includes my global producers who they work directly with the digital advocates in the market. So I have two people and they communicate with our 32 markets regularly. Um, the digital advocates in the markets actually do all of the posting, directly manage the community, review their own metrics, although we also look at them from a global perspective, um, and build a local editorial calendar. What our global team does is provide an overall global digital calendar that gets adapted by the markets. Um, guidance in terms of social media strategy, news, changes in terms of what's happening at a platform level. Um, we also create a large number of graphical assets that are designed to be shared. Um, and we provide them in something called a t digital toolkit um, for each campaign launch or each key communications messaging um, strategy that we have. We'll create a digital toolkit that's specifically designed for these individuals to help jumpstart their content creation process so they don't have to create everything from scratch. Um, we also provide the global scorecard. You know, training the team is always a big challenge. I think it's, it, honestly, for some brands, it's petrifying to think of having people in all these countries and languages they don't understand managing these highly sensitive communications. So um, one of the things that's been critical for us is training. And we have to do it on a shoestring, because we do everything on a shoestring at Benefit Cosmetics. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we really start with, and it's so fundamental for us, um, is really just making sure everyone understands the roots of our DNA and our brand. And, Sometimes you're running so fast you forget to do this. So actually, just two years ago, we developed a, a very extensive um, brand book that would help our markets understand who we are. And we're very lucky in terms of developing our social media voice because we have a very distinctive DNA which makes it relatively easy for these digital advocates to understand how to personify the brand in their own language. Um, some of the characteristics of our, of our DNA are the San Francisco scene. We're a quirky, irreverent brand. We're not a typical New York or Paris-based fashion brand. Independence is something that's a big part of our spirit. Um, laughter and fun, which is a huge part of who we are. Our creative and irreverent names and packaging is a big part of who we are. Um, one of our key components is a duality of bold and girly. So while everything is hyper-feminine, I mean, you can't use a straight line in Benefit Cosmetics. People get pissed 
if they see a square box of anything. Everything's got a curve, everything's rounded. Um, so that's the sort of, and everything is pink, you know? So that's the girly side, but the other side is this bold, irreverent side. And when you give people this kind of a DNA to work with, frankly, content development becomes much easier. So really working on that foundation has helped us quite a bit. Um, we also provide a copy style guide, but that copy style, style guide is English, in English, so it needs to be adapted in the markets. Um, I create a global digital playbook every year that aligns the markets in terms of what our priorities are, and they're responsible for delivering back their local market playbook that helps me understand what tactics they're going to use to achieve their goals, and also where they have unique differences in their market and how they're gonna be focused because of that. Because we might have different social networks in certain countries. Um, for example, in Asia, people spend a lot more time on bulletin boards and in forums than they do in the United States and the UK. It's a much more important source of information, whereas in the United States and the UK, we see people almost exclusively spending their time in social media, uh, particularly uh, Facebook and Twitter. So where our language permits it, we do certainly monitor the communications and give feedback and coach, um, but we simply can't always do that. Um, in addition, we have a few additional components of our training. So we have a global digital summit where we bring everyone together, all those digital advocates. Um, we just had a, a two-day summit and we um, bring external speakers in as well as have our internal speakers from different markets talk about their best practices. Uh, we have a bi-weekly digital um, update that we send out via email. We have a quarterly digital newsletter where we share the best practices and success stories from the markets. And finally, we actually have a private digital Facebook group where all of our digital advocates are subscribed, except for the ones in China, because they can't get onto Facebook. But everyone else is in this group. And in the beginning, it was just me <laughs> try, talking to myself. Um, you know, it was silence, radio silence. But over time, we have uh, had our digital advocates become more and more vocal in sharing in a very organic manner what things are working for them for the market, which is hugely, hugely helpful. Um, just an example of a, a toolkit that we delivered. So one of the things we'll, we'll do is develop a sample schedule of when, for example, for a given campaign, this was our Brow Love campaign, um, when for a given campaign different activities should hit. When we recommend that blog posts should be published, we will develop some of those blog posts in English. Um, all of the social media status updates, we had a series of quotes from a book that we actually published on Browse. Um, we, we suggest a calendar and then we ask the markets to localize it because we might find, for example, in the United States that between the hours of six and eight, you get the best response rates, but that might differ in another market based on typical working hours. So this, the playbook um, and the toolkits are really guidelines and then we ask the markets to adapt and there will be a few compulsory elements of the toolkit and then a lot of freedom for the markets to push and change those elements. So just a few more examples of things that we created in the toolkit, some great quotes that people can share. We've actually moved um, some video clips that we create for them. We've actually moved to a more visual style with the text outside of the graphics because it's easier to localize. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about measuring success globally um, in social media. So we did develop a global scorecard and everybody wants to know how to make social measurement work. Um, and so we've actually taken advantage of the fact that essentially we do have 24 different Facebook fan pages around the world. So we're getting data on how consumers respond and we use that data to create a little bit of competitiveness between the markets um, and to identify which things are working and which ones aren't. So the US, which is our largest market, actually had been seeing a bit of a decline for a little while and we used the scorecard to give them a little kick in the butt and help them learn from what the other markets are doing. <laughs> U.S. reports to me, so I was giving myself a kick in the butt, but um, I do that a lot. Uh, so some of the things we measure, um, of course we look at total likes because that's a factor of how many people we can reach and we look at the growth there, heavily influenced by the amount of an ad spend. So frankly, doesn't help us develop better content, helps us understand how effective we're being at acquiring new people to speak to. Um, we look at our engagement rate, which is essentially the number of engaged users as compared to the number of users that we have or the number of, re or, or the reach that we have. And it's very important for this metric to measure engagement against um, your organic and viral posts, not just against your ads, because they really skew the numbers. It's not to say that advertising and sponsored stories aren't very important for leveraging social media, but um, we also want to understand how effective is our content. Is our content something that our consumers are choosing to engage with, yes or no? And so by having different ways to slice the data, we're able to see that better. 
So the scorecard has helped us and we, break, we chose to actually break down the information. We primarily look at it by week. We can also look at it by month. We found that by month was almost too big to see the impact of activities. So by week really helps us see, okay, did a given campaign or a given um, focus in terms of communications or a given contest really move the numbers for a given market? And I wanted to give you an example of how we help the markets uh, push each other a little bit. So one of the things we roll up, uh, does it have a little, like, does this have a little, aha, yeah. One of the things that, <laughs> head of digital can't work off projectors. Um, you know, one of the things that we do is roll up the numbers. So this is for a number of our small and emerging markets. We looked at their engagement rate in a given month in February, and you see a huge change. I mean, why does Greece have a 27% engagement rate that particular month? And why does the Netherlands have a 4% engagement rate? And uh, doing this on a monthly basis and even being able to compare the numbers on a weekly basis helps us understand what happened. And we do see a difference in engagement rate in different markets. Um, the Asian market is definitely much, much more engaged in social media and emerging markets are much more engaged. I think that's a factor of less noise because not every brand out there is doing a great job with social media in those markets. So there's a little bit less noise so we can be heard a little bit better. But we definitely see specific activities that specific markets do, and then we can really help share the, that, those activities and try them in new markets. So essentially, it's very hard to measure and understand exactly what your competitors are doing in order to drive activity, but sometimes you can do a little bit of measurement even within your own organization to help drive better activity. I wanted to give you an example of how local innovation has really helped us, because it's one thing to talk about it in broad numbers, and it's another thing to show something that the team did. So um, last year, we actually launched a new skincare line um, called the Be Right Radiant Skincare Line. And um, as you can see from the graphic, it's really focused on the idea of radiance and brightness. Um, the challenge for us in, and I'll give an example, the market of Hong Kong, is that um, brightening and skin whitening um, are a big category there, and our product doesn't do that at all. So our product development team, you know, named the product something that in that particular market was somewhat confusing, right? And then we didn't want to attract a ton of people to try a product that would do the opposite of what they thought it might do. So our team in Hong Kong developed a campaign to help educate consumers on what we mean by that term. Um, a good solution for a challenge for them. And so um, what they did is really, they had a campaign objective to create some pre-buzz for our skincare launch and help people understand this idea of what a Be Right Gal is or what brightness means to benefit. And so they started with a teaser video that they published on YouTube and spent money um, socially to drive. And that teaser video actually drove people to our Facebook fan page where people could learn even more about this through an additional video. And I'll just show you the teaser video and then tell you a little bit about the rest of the campaign. Do I just escape? And you can, we can maybe just, I'll talk over it because most of you don't speak Cantonese, right? So <laughs> we, um, we, we used a, a local celebrity called Dr. Joe. <laughs> um, it's okay that the volume's not on it. I, well, it would be nice to have a little volume. Can we get that? Or? Well, it's okay, I think we can just keep going. So Dr. Joe comes along and asks people, what does brightness really mean? Is it is Lady Gaga bright? And this is Dr. Joe doing all these questions. Uh -huh. Well, what about this? Is this what bright is? So this was at the time that Black Swan was released. A lot of skin whitening going on, right? So now he says, come to Facebook to learn more about it. Um, and then, and I don't, the app isn't live anymore, but what we ne did next, I'll just go back to view slideshow mode, yeah? Um, oh, no. <laughs> Um, so what we did then is drove people to Facebook where Dr. Joe once again asked people about what brightness meant 
And um, we had a new video in which we actually pulled in the user's own photo and then pulled in photos of their friends and asked them to choose which person represented brightness and radiance for them. And by choosing those friends, both our fans and their friends got an offer to come and sample our skincare in the stores. And um, of course, sampling is huge, and especially promoting so sampling in social media is very successful. So we ran out of all of our samples um, and did a great job introducing the product. In addition, we actually were lucky enough to grow our Facebook fans 75% during this campaign. Normally during a similar period, which is about one month, you would see a much smaller increase, maybe somewhere between 5 and 10% without an advertising spend. Um, and in addition, this market has turned out to be one of our strongest markets for skincare, so from a challenge to an opportunity. Another example of local innovation um, paying off, we, um, reduced, we introduced a very successful mascara last year. Uh, it's called They're Real. And as you can see, this is a global power visual. Um, the, the, the visual really plays with the question of which thing is real. Um, <laughs> you guess. <laughs> um, they were both substantial on this model, I'll say, but um, <laughs> the mascara is the part that's real, and so we have her hooked up to a lie detector. Um, a great power visual, and um, uh, what I think our team in France did a great job of is taking that power visual. They actually, I won't show the video because I know we're running a little late today, but they did do a great job of creating their own local video in which they had a gal from France who you know, went through her whole lie detector process and received an offer to go into store. We promoted it specifically via, via a rather small newsletter um, called My Little Paris, which reaches, I think, about 150,000 people. Um, it's the kind of thing that a global team would never even know existed, frankly. Um, but our local team knew because they are sitting in Paris and they're chic gals. And so um, they found this newsletter for us, and we did a specific offer um, with a video to introduce the product and a call to action inside of the video to come into our stores for a sample. We co-created it with My Little Paris, so it was very well received by their consumer base. Um, we also ran a banner ad. We had a 50% open rate on the email we sent out, so if, for those of you in e um, email marketing know that that's like an absurd number, never to be seen again at Benefit Cosmetics, I, I fear. Um, <laughs> Uh, 29% click-through rate versus something more like an average of around 12%. 10% of their subscriber list in total went to our stores to redeem the offer, and we had a 26% conversion um, in store. And because this product really does a great job of delivering what we call, you know, lashes that are beyond belief, um, we see a very good repeat rate on, on those product purchases. So one example was sort of how a local market created content, I think, that was very unique to solve a problem, and another, an example of how a local market took advantage of a vehicle or a channel that we simply wouldn't have known about at a global level. Would this be successful in Oh, okay. Let's see if we can get it loaded. We must have some French in the room, so. We're sold exclusively through Sephora in France, so we wanted to drive people into Sephora for their sample. It's our country, one of our store managers in, the, in there. Got a little mention for our brow bars, which is always good, and for our brow services. We wanted to work in, this is a lot of people's first introduction to benefit, so we wanted to show them a range of our services and products we make every little tiny thing we do work so hard. Those are our star products. Brow mapping, which is the process by which we help determine how to do a brow arch. I wouldn't have included this moment when we talk about negative things, but. Et vous voulez me faire croire ces jeux de biche là, c'est de l'authentique. Allez, 
Fini les boliments. Vous allez passer au détecteur. Oui, bien. They're real. Honest. And so there's the video that goes. Sephora. And then, of course, Sephora gets their little mention, so they're happy too because they're a key retailer, right? Um, so that is essentially a quick summary of what we're doing. Um, key opportunities. <laughs> um, certainly, simply managing content and syndicating content across these markets. Communications is a challenge. Um, you know, efficiently sharing our learnings. And certainly, um, in social media, there's a, everybody likes to do custom applications, particularly for Facebook, but they're very expensive to localize. So we've relied much more heavily on simpler forms of content and communication because there's simply more leverage for us. May I answer any questions? Thank you. Yep, we have a question right here. That was engaging and informative. Thank you. Good, good. Um, we've talked a lot the last couple of days about all the benefits of how we can connect to consumers and understand them better and the positive sides of social media mm -hmm. and this is not really based on your talk but I, I wanted to know if you've had experiences where let's say there's a product failure or you have an ad that didn't go over well and you start to get negative exposure mm -hmm. how do you respond to that because you know it goes viral is that the term or yeah. whatever it cuts and both ways doesn't it exactly <laughs> so maybe you could comment on how you address those negative sides yeah certainly you're absolutely right. Something that's very powerful on a positive side can quickly become very frightening on a negative side. And we have had one problem with some negative publicity around um, a specific product at one point um, during my tenure and a number of customer service issues. And frankly, for me, as much as possible, the number one priority is to respond to the consumers who are um, talking about the problem um, in a direct way and get the conversation off so social media as quickly so really the same approach that you would take if a customer in a store started throwing a conniption, you know, you would, as much as possible, a skilled manager would try to pull that customer aside and have a private dialogue with them. So, you know, step number one is to have our social media managers or our customer care manager reach out to the customer and ask them if we can please talk to them directly. So we try as much as possible, unless it's just a few people saying, oh, I didn't like that. You know, frankly, we're like a black licorice brand, right? Not everybody loves us but the people who do love us very much. So we don't worry about a little bit of negative sentiment. And in fact, there are quite a number of studies, LQ has some stats on this that show that a certain amount of negative sentiment actually creates credibility within your community. Because people know that you're not filtering out all the bad posts. So someone saying, I love this lip gloss, but somebody else saying it's not long wearing enough for me, is actually validating because you've got 18 people saying I love this lip gloss because of the color and the payoff, and two people saying not long wearing enough. That's market insight for us, as well as validity, that this is a genuine community. So we don't worry about the little things, but the big things, we try as much as possible to bring that dialogue privately if we can. We have a policy, we do not delete posts ever, unless they're personally attacking or truly a lie. Like at one point we had someone who was saying something very untrue about our production process. And so we did post a comment about our production process and our sourcing practices, but we removed a few of the things that were very direct lies. Um, but generally speaking, we try very hard not to remove items to, to respond exactly as we would in any customer in any other customer service um, situation. Thanks. That's actually very clear, and um, it's a, it's a really good point you make to take the conversation off of social media as soon as possible without like messing up with it, basically. Okay. So the one question I had for you actually was. Um, was related to the fact that you're saying to localize social media because mm -hmm. something that I've had, um, I've seen by experience and I've read about as well is that, um, com so for instance, one thing you, you brought up is that in Asia, the um, since fewer people, so to say, of everyone in Asia are online, the sentiment and the conversations are quite interesting to read. Mm -hmm. However, in the, in the US, what I've noticed is that Americans very happily vent on the internet. <laughs> So, um, so the you thing never is, you never got a bunch of haters like <laughs> the French, number one, biggest haters in the world, <laughs> and the Americans, the second biggest haters. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, what's your take on that, and how does that impact then um, localizing social media when you know that there is this kind of tinted perception that people are more happy talking negatively on the internet in certain countries than they are in 
other countries. Well, frankly, you have to remember that the consumers who are seeing that negative content are used to that context as well, right? So in the United States, first of all, I wouldn't agree at all that we have that more US consumers are in social media than Asia, quite the opposite. Um, it's easier for us to attract a fan base than we find a more engaged fan base. And for our product, which admittedly is a prestige product, we have a lot more consumers um, in Asia who are engaging with the brand in social media than we do in the US. But um, I think overall, yeah, um, we, we definitely think that consumers are used to their local context. So people, I mean, YouTube is a great example of the greatest haters in the world, you know? We, you will never have so many negative comments in response to a video as you will on YouTube. The same video posted on YouTube versus Facebook, you'll have a much po more positive overall sentiment and response rate on Facebook than you will on YouTube, um, even though YouTube allows us to reach new people. So I think we just accept that consumers know the medium that they're in. They're incredibly savvy. They know what amount of positive and negative comments are normal and what amount you know, are out of whack. And so we, we I don't want to say we're laissez-faire, but we're very accepting of the fact that those differences exist. Okay, good point, because then that uh, still strengthens the fact that we should localize social media. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Thank you so much. I left my Twitter in case anybody wants to get in touch with my handle. Thanks. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs>